You just found the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast on YouTube. This is Mind Pump. Okay. So we're going to give away a shirt again. By the way, these shirts are going like crazy. I think it's because people's gains go through the roof as soon as they put them on. This shirt is magic. It's beautiful. Obviously, it's sexy. You can get this for free. Very easy. Here's what you need to do, okay? In the next 24 hours, as soon as we drop this video, comment underneath. Tell us what your favorite free guide is. You might be wondering what uh, I'm talking about. Go to mindpumpfree.com. We have tons of guides on there. We have a guide that teaches people how to squat better, how to build bigger arms, how to get leaner, um, how to get a better golf swing. We have tons and tons of guides at mindpumpfree.com. They're totally, totally free. Go on there, download them. You can download all of them. Tell us your favorite guide in the comments in the next 24 hours and why. Doug will go through, pick the best one. Then what he's going to do is going to mail this shirt right to your face. It's going to go right to your door. You're going to open up the door. There's the shirt. Put it on. Boom. Boom. On your face. You're sexy right away. Also, subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications because we do giveaways with every single episode. Oh, one more thing before we start this awesome podcast. And by the way, this podcast is awesome. Uh, one more thing. The Phase 2 bundle that includes MAPS Aesthetic and MAPS Performance, two of our most popular programs, which discounts them by like 70%, right? You get them both for $79.99. That promotion ends in three days. After that, it's gone. Gone forever. You'll never get this again, okay? So go to mapsfebruary.com. Go check it out. Sign up. You got 30 days to try both programs. They don't blow your mind. Return them for a full refund. You literally have nothing to lose. One more thing. If you ever hear us talking on the podcast about products or partners or people we work with, you can always go check them out or go just go see if we have discounts with your favorite companies. Go to mindpumppartners.com. All right. Enjoy the show. Hey, Doug, are you keeping track, uh, a tally of how many times now uh, people have missed workouts, like Adam, for example? What? You have a running tally here. Yeah. Well, get out of here. I think he's first, first place. Uh, that was intentional. Huh? That's intentional. You, you want to be first place yeah. on the tally? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I recently came across um, uh, Lane's girl, Holly, Holly Baxter's uh, post. She mm. did a post a, a couple days ago. That referred to a study that was done in 2015. Oh, Did you see this? Yes. And I, I was, I don't know how I had never seen this before. And it says that they, they took a group. I think it was like 15 or 20, and they had two different or two different groups. One group trained uh, consistently for 24 weeks. Then another group uh, trained for three weeks with a one week break. Three weeks with one re mm -hmm. one week break. And basically, her her post her post was if you miss a workout or whatever, if you miss a few days, will you lose your gains? And then they showed it over the course of twenty four weeks. Now, what you would expect to see is the consistent group had a obviously a kind of a consistent arch to progress. progress, right? And then the other one, every time they took off, it had this sharp dip because they took you know a week off, and you know it doesn't take that long for atrophies to start to set in. But what ended up happening at the end of twenty four weeks is they were they were met. So I thought this was really fascinating. So this that, is why you missed your workout. Yeah, this is, <laughs> you like <laughs> that? You like that? Yeah, he's ready. He's like back to about the step method. Back to by the science, climb. motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it! Yeah, yeah. I can't argue with that. Yeah. No. Okay. So this, I did look at this study. It's actually kind of <laughs> interesting, but I have some speculations on it. Uh, so it was twenty four weeks. Uh, the workout was full body three days a week. They did three sets per body part. Uh, intensity was 75%. It was 14 people okay. that they were in the study. And yeah, at the end of the 24 weeks, um, it was pretty much equal in terms of, of progress. But yeah, like you said, Adam, as you would expect, the group that took a week off would, would lose strength and size within that week, but then it would come back very quickly Yeah, when they come back to work out. I, this, to me, highlights a couple different things. Uh, one... Muscle memory is mm -hmm. a very real thing, okay? I, as, as long as, as I've been training people and working out, however long it takes you to build muscle, when you lose it, if you build it, the, the hard part about building muscle is the first time you build it. Mm -hmm. After that, it's easy. It really is. Like If it takes you a year to gain 10 pounds of muscle, let's just, and that's a lot of muscle in your like lean muscle, it takes you a year and then you lose it. You'll gain back ten pounds in like a month. Right. I mean, it comes back in a hurry. So to me, that's kind of what it what it highlights. Well, I, I mean, I thought it was really fascinating that in in a sh that short of a period of time, I would have expected uh, over a year, right? Mm -hmm. So if it was like a year long study, and then you have these like periodic breaks, I would actually think it would almost probably favor you sometimes. Mm -hmm. But in a short study of only tw 24, 24 weeks, right? That's not that crazy long. 
to have that ma- six months. Yeah, to have that many breaks. So basically, every month you're taking a week off mm-hmm. yeah. uh, of the out of the week, and then to still have as much gains as the group who consistently trained every single week. I, I find that very fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting. I. I mean, there's got to be advantages, though, to the ones that are consistent because, like, that whole mental part of it, like, to take a week off and then come back, like, that must have been hard to drum that back. Yeah. So here's the flaw, okay? Here's the flaw that I found in this I found in this study is the, the difference is the person, if, if it was me, right, training those two, those two different styles, if I'm consistent for 24 weeks, I'm also scaling my volume during mm-hmm. that time. Mm-hmm. Where if I go for three weeks, then I fall off for a week and then come back. So... It's n- kind of not fair to to say that the person who consistently went for 24 weeks would be training exactly the same way as the person who's all every three weeks, right? Would yes, you- I agree with you. And I also I also think, because what we're looking at here is a 24-week period, young men, uh, and what we're not considering is the skill acquisition you get from uh, practicing exercise. The more advanced you get, the more your skill plays a role in mm-hmm. your strength. And so consistency is more important. I think there's nothing wrong with going easier Mm -hmm. in a week, but still practice the exercises. Taking a whole week off over time, first of all, it's better, way better than nothing. So let's be honest here. There's, there's, it's way, way better than nothing. But with my experience with training people for as long as I have, it's better to stay consistent and continue to practice and practice and practice because muscle memory is real. The skill aspect of it, though, uh, at the end of a year, two years, three years, your skill of pressing and rowing and squatting and whatnot, you're just going to be better well, off. Well, that's why I think the three three on, you know, one off wouldn't be ideal in terms of, like, learning a new skill and really getting really good at it. However, it also highlights the fact that it's not that detrimental for you to take a week off. Totally. You know, you could just bounce back. It just, you know, it, it, it shows in the study it's not going to be that far off. Well, yeah. that's why – So, and I agree with her post. That that was the – the, obviously, the point of her post was to to challenge people to like not freak out because you miss the gym for a week. Or, sure, you know if you miss the gym even for a few days, and I think that's what happens to us a lot of times. Psychologically, what happens is you miss a few days and you go, ah, oh, fuck it. Yeah, and then yeah. You, then what you am just, I even doing? Right, you write it all off because you had a bad week or whatever. But the reality is, is that you're probably just fine. Now, here's the other thing: we tend to look at exercise so in such a small scale in the sense that you know myopically, right? Like the, all the benefits we get from exercise size are the strength gain, the muscle, and the fat loss. We forget all the other th- potential benefits that are also very real and very, very important that you get from exercise. For example, my daily exercise is a form of, of de-stressing, motivation. It's a form of being present. It's allowing me to take a break, to focus on myself, to care for myself type of deal. You don't get that when you take that week off. That's why I think it's better to go easier still take that time for yourself. So the psychological benefits, we never measure any of that, right? And well, not to, and then here's the other part of it. How many people do you know could be consistent at three weeks on, one week off versus being consistent all the time? Yeah. I I, I know the average person- Well, one of them will turn into a habit, the other one's not, right? Yes. Because yeah. you're breaking that up all the time. I agree with that. But I mean, I would also challenge that and say- Okay, instead of taking the week off and just doing like lighter exercise, I mean that whole week could actually be like meditation, yoga, totally. sauna. You know, totally. What I'm so like, I like the idea of okay, my goal is I never miss this seven a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday workout or whatever. But it's different, but it's different. So, but every third or you know every uh, fourth week, I'm gonna work inward. I'm gonna do things like sauna, reading, meditation, stuff that is more recuperative, and then I'll get right back on my training program. Right now, but and, okay, and then on the other side too, I think the more advanced you are, the more consistent you need to be to continue to see uh, improvements. So, you know, when you get to a point when you're yeah. like, like Adam, you were training at the pro level. I don't know if that would have been as effective to take a complete week off. No, you couldn't, every three you weeks. couldn't because of the amount of volume. And that's what I, that, that's the one flaw in this study. Mm-hmm. And that's what I meant by that is I know when I'm consistent for six months, my level of volume at the end of six months versus where I was at week one. Your recovery one. ability just yeah, keeps going. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, uh, intensity has been slowly. So what they, I'm sure they kept first. For, and this is where studies are flawed. Is you know, yeah, for it, for all intents and purposes, I, I agree with what it said. But 
there are some other variables that you're not accounting for that you would be doing differently if you were consistently training. I would be consistently progressively overloading in that time where they probably right. kept their training program exactly the same to basically prove the point that you could take a week off. Yeah, they weren't that. like, uh, you know, adding more load and like, yes. yeah, progressively getting that. That's just that, that seems weird to me. You know, you wouldn't work out like that. Right, right. right. It's, it reminds me of studies that are like, there was that one study. I don't remember what, how long it was, but it was a short period of time, maybe a few months, and they compared a hack squat to a barbell squat, I yeah. believe. And at the end of the short study, they said, oh, they both build equal amounts of muscle in the lower body. Therefore, they're equal. They're not. They're not equal. Even if that was the case, they're still not equal because squats are more functional. I feel like you're going to continue to progress with squats much longer than you will with hack squats, blah, blah, blah. It's very different. Oh, excuse me. It's very difficult, I should say, to study the effects of, of exercise long, long term. Because yeah. I've trained people for three months, six months, one year, five years. I've trained people for 10 years. And you see trends and differences the longer you start to work out with people. Well, you also brought up another thing that changes too. So I, or at least this is in my experience, okay, and I want to hear if you guys are the same. When I'm training and consistent, I'm also a better eater. When I'm when There's I all the, all those side downstream effects exactly right? and so those things are so these things I'm sure they control for to keep it similar in a fair playing mm -hmm. field, mm -hmm. but when I am off for a week, it throws off everything. I'm not as disciplined with my eating because I'm kind of like oh, I didn't mm -hmm. work out today, whatever. Yes, and then here's the other mm -hmm. thing too is a lot, and this is a something that's common with um, a lot of studies. A lot of studies tend to be done on college aged uh, males. Okay, now there's a reason for this. The reason is. When you're conducting a study and you're looking for people to pay, you know, a cheap <laughs> fee yeah. to be in your study, it's usually college age males. They need money. They're available. They're available and they're willing to take risks. Like, yeah. hey, we're gonna give you a you know placebo <laughs> or a drug, yeah. or we're gonna train you. <laughs> I'm to down. Yeah. yeah, and it's some twenty something year old dude that's like, yeah. okay, whatever. for fifty bucks. Yeah, Maybe yeah. side effects or yeah. may not. Yeah. You know, who knows? Are you guys gonna give us lunch? Yeah. Like, I'm down. Like, no problem. <laughs> and there's a problem with that in a lot of these studies because I'll tell you this: I tra towards the end of my career, I had a decent chunk of my clientele that were in advanced age. Here's what I saw with people in advanced age. When they stopped training, the decline in strength and mobility was alarmingly fast. Very different from a 20-something year old. A 20-something year old could take a few weeks off of exercise and you know, you definitely would notice when they come back to the gym, but it wasn't profound. You take somebody who's 60 or 70, they take a few weeks off of exercise, it's almost like they took it's like they took 6 months or a year off of exercise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cuz you're fighting the body, uh, you're fighting that downhill effect that happens as you get older. The older you get, the faster it is. I'll never forget. I've told this story before. I'll, I'll tell it again. It was just to me it was so shocking. I had this woman that I trained. She was in advanced age. Her daughter hired me because she started to show some decline in, in, in being able to take care of herself. There was a little bit of signs of dementia where she would ask me to tell, you know, to say the same thing over a couple times or whatever. And I trained this woman for a few years, trained her for a while. And over that few year period, she seemed to stay stable. I got her a little bit stronger. She moved a little bit better. You know, the progress was slow. Definitely didn't decline, and her mental capacity seemed relatively stable, even though she came to me with some early signs of dementia. Well, anyhow, mm -hmm. one day she was at home taking a shower, slip. She slipped, broke a bone, so she was on bed rest. Her, her daughter had to hire somebody to take care of her full time, which meant she couldn't afford to hire me as a personal trainer. I ran into this woman, it, I think it was like seven months later. She was, first off, her posture, which we were always working on, which wasn't great, but we maintained it. Her, she was so bent over in a walker. It was like almost like she was you know, horizontal to the ground. I ran into her. This is a woman I trained for years. Mm -hmm. I ran into her and I said, oh my gosh, hey, how you doing? And she looked up. I, I know it broke my heart. She looked I recognize up. recognize you. She's like, Who, do I know you? Who yeah. are you? The decline was so fast. Yeah, yeah. So like taking time off from all activity as you get older it's a little bit different. Muscle memory starts to work a little bit different, and, and you go down faster the older you get. Yeah, I had this uh, very similar experience. Uh, I was training a lady who had MS, and 
um, you know, every day that she was in there, we, we would try and schedule it like almost four or five times a week because it was so beneficial for her movement and mm -hmm. her cognitive ability and just everything else like was just like, it was like based off of momentum almost where, where she took like a week off and then it was like, I literally was just trying to work with her on just walking again and like just doing basic, See? really basic things. I couldn't, you know, I got, to, I got her to a point where she was doing all these like presses with dumbbells and exercises with dumbbells and moving, you know, on her own without any supports and, you know, and then it just completely went away. Way. Yeah, because my fear with studies like this is you're going to get people who will be like, oh, uh, daily activity is not that important. I'll keep the same amount of muscle. There's so many other benefits to yeah. daily movement yeah. and activity. So if you want what you should take from the study, especially if you're young and healthy, is I can take a week off of weight training, but I should still be active and do something else. Not like I'm going to take a week off eat a bunch of shitty food, sit in front of the TV, and then it's all good. Well, I just think it's... And then also not to beat yourself up over missing a few days, right? right? So here... I mean, like you I'm, go on vacation. Right, you know? well, I was in the middle of a move. So the last three days, I haven't got any lift... Or two days, I didn't get any lifting. Today would be the third day. And we've been uh, can very, very consistent... I was moving, lifting. I mean, I yeah. probably burned more calories doing that. I'm not stressed out because I know that I'm not going to like yeah. all of a sudden get weaker. Over but this well, you're, you're older too. I can tell you lost some muscle <laughs> when you walked in. Hey, I told Justin, hey, there's some. Like, hey, Sam, you lost muscle. Hey, bro, there's some truth to that though. <laughs> I, today, I mean, ask yourself this right now, right? So I, are a little, well, little how loose. I feel yeah. today versus when I was in my 20s. I used to say this, right? If someone caught me eating fast food or I had taken like a month off of training or something, and they're like, "Oh man, I thought you were a trainer." Ah. Two weeks, I have it all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I used to say that. Yeah. That was like a, that was like a Ooh, thing. I thought you're a trainer. I, I remember that. So they said that to me. I was like, oh, yeah. You're, yeah. you're right in the heart. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. all right. Two How weeks. Two you. weeks. I'm yeah. I'm beach ready. Now, now you're like, yeah, it's all right. Two yeah. months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. So there was another study that I read that was also making the rounds, uh, and this was comparing plant protein to animal protein. I told you guys briefly when we went for a walk uh, outside last week. Um, so here's what the study was, right? So they took, so we we know other studies show that animal protein on a gram per gram basis is more as more bioavailable, has more of the beneficial higher you know higher amounts of beneficial amino acids, leucine, the branched chain amino acids, uh, etc. And so uh, studies will show that if you eat 50 grams of animal protein versus 50 grams of plant protein, it seems like the animal protein is just going to be you know, more beneficial for you, especially if you're trying to build muscle and, you know, improve your athletic ability. Well, this study took two groups of people and they gave them 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So this is actually a pretty high protein diet, right? Yeah. So it's you're they're in that range of the upper limits of, of getting benefit from protein. Previous studies show that about 0.6 to 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight is the where you're gonna get the upper limit of benefit from protein. Any more than that, and it's just extra. Well, calories. okay, you got to break that down a little bit better because one you you just referenced per pound, the other one you referenced kilogram. Which yes, you're talking about two. So it's two, a kilogram is two point two pounds. Correct, correct. So one point six grams per two point two, which is right in that range that that I said. Before. Right, so right. It's considered upper limit of protein. Uh, any any protein above that, you're probably not going to see any additional. Or you you likely won't see any additional benefit. So one group. Animal, all uh, they had an omnivore diet and they had a lot of animal protein. The other group, completely plant based, and they supplemented with soy protein. What did they find at the end of the study? They found that there were no difference in in progress. Yeah, but this is something that you've talked you've talked about this multiple times yes. on the show before, which is in a in a, a situation where you're getting adequate or more than enough. Yeah, protein, if you're hitting those limits. Yeah, you're hitting. Then you can be getting it from collagen protein. You can be getting it from you know bone broth protein. You can be getting it from whey protein. All things are pretty equal. Where it matters the most is when you don't hit those exactly. those numbers. What that's then that source comes into play on which one's more valuable. Exactly. So if you're pro if you're not hitting those numbers. Uh, where you're getting, you know, that 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight, or to round it up, one gram of protein per pound of body weight, then the type of protein that you take in really starts to matter. Like I remember, I'd have clients who, a lot of clients actually, this is quite common, where it was very difficult for them to hit those protein targets. Usually women, um, but you know, protein is very satiating, uh, so it's hard to just get. Like if you, you know, if you're a 200 pound man. 
you're, you know, that's 170 grams or so of protein. That's a lot of protein uh, in, a, in a day. It can be very difficult. 130 pound female, she's trying to aim for, you know, close to 100 grams of protein, yeah. right? It can be kind of difficult. In those cases, when the, when the clients would get less than that or much less than that, if I had them supplement with like branched chain amino acids or if I had them focus on, you know, whey or, or meat, they got, I could see a big difference. Mm -hmm. But when the protein's high, it doesn't matter. It yeah. just doesn't matter. And so this is just one of the, this study confirms that, that you are getting adequate amounts of all those amino acids if your protein's high. It really doesn't matter where it's coming from. At that point, when your protein is high, here's what I always recommend to people, because they always say, well, I have high protein. Should I still pay attention? But like, yeah, here's what you should pay attention to. What protein is easiest on your gut? What protein can you digest the most or the easiest? That's the one that you should take in yeah, yeah. and not worry about the other stuff. I got to uh, gotta shout out the uh, Mind Pump Memes guy, which by the way, this is, I've, it, for the listener, the, the he's not affiliated with us. It's not uh, the company that actually makes these. But no, he just roasts us. Yeah, he does a really good <laughs> job <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and now it's, he must have went, okay, so he did a post. Uh, you guys stirred up, you stirred up all kinds of shit with the sitting down peeing thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he found, he must have, I mean, that that picture, I, I don't even know if I have that on my Instagram or where he got that, <laughs> but I'm wearing like a pink he's hat. Super resourceful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, dude! Yeah. He, yeah, and he got some. I read a study on that, by the way. What? So somebody listened to the episodes where we were razzing you for for peeing, uh, sitting down. There's, There's a, a study, study on this. There's a study. I think god, you have dude. to you have to make like that when you really... say I pee when I sit down. You can't just leave it there. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning. It's fun to say. I that, yeah, just... I know it is for you fuckers. I stand up and pee ninety nine percent of the time. When I get up at two o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, make that That's clear. Different. He, yeah. keeps, he keeps it tucked all night. He gets up oh and just sits God. right down. So oh. tell me this study. Tell all right. Me. So someone sent me a study that showed that uh, men with uh, lower urinary tract issues, like benign prostate enlargement, which you know everyone in this room at some point is going to have. It's just called, it's like ninety percent of men will have prostate enlargement at some point. You actually right. get you actually get ready for this better urine flow sitting down. So there you go, Adam. Wow. Yeah, so so now maybe there maybe I'm just I'm naturally drawn to do that. Yeah, I don't know what the hell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even. Yeah. That's hilarious. So, so next time we uh, razz you just be like, you hey, just man, gave him an excuse. I get better urine flow. <laughs> <laughs> See, but you know here's the thing. I disagree. I get better urine flow standing up. I don't know. It's uh, seriously. I have I'm, I'm sitting down at some it doesn't Well, I got to be honest. I've never I've never paid attention to that and Dude, that I did was This not reminds the, me of a funny story. Yeah. So are you guys able to when you're in the ocean swimming? Right, mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. like, you're, and I'm talking about like in the ocean, not like on the sand, but your feet don't touch. Right, you're in the water. Mm. Can are you guys able to pee in the ocean? In the ocean, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, mean, I, I can't, go, dude. You I can't. can't, dude. I went on this, so I don't remember. Are you how, afraid of getting salt in there? Or I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't go backwards. Yeah, it just, you know, <laughs> it clears it's like it a out. Vacuum. I I was uh, I think Jessica and I were in we were in Maui. I think this was like I mean, or no, it was Kauai a couple years ago. And we were snorkeling or whatever, and I had to pee hella bad, yeah. and the waves were kind of strong. <laughs> so I'm like in the water, and the waves are kind of. And Is every, she right behind you? She's next to me, dude. Oh, and every time I'm jerk. about to pee, a wave hits me. And you guys know I'm a little uncomfortable in the ocean anyway. Yeah. A wave, and it's I, I tighten back up, dude. I was in the water for an hour pushing. I was going to shit my pants. Oh, I thought oh, I honey, we got to go back. <laughs> I can't do this. Yeah, you I thought it had something to do with your thing being out, you like fish getting fish or something. Yeah, that's no, what I thought. I'm not yeah. naked. I still uh, got my, uh, you know, yeah. my thing on. No, it just reminds me of the horror story. It was, it's somewhere in the Amazon, the, the, uh, you know, in the Amazon river where it has like this little tiny fish. I think this is total urban legend, but it, apparently it like swims up your pee hole. Yeah. If you pee. No, that's real. Didn't we look that up one time? I think so. Yeah. yeah I, I think, think it's like attracted to the urine and then it goes. Right. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Like that's the yeah. ultimate deterrent. What you want to do is put those in public pools. Dude, <laughs> I, I, I like how fast is that fish though? I feel like if I felt it immediately, I'd, it'd be gone. But oh yeah, look at See, this. See, yeah, we did look it up. It's a it's a Kandiru, Amazonian parasitic catfish. Oh. Tiny Amazonian parasitic catfish reported to swim into urethral and other openings. Other, oh, I didn't hear about that. Oh, it's That's... also known as Canero, Camaro, and urethra fish and is a member of El the Penetrator. genus Vandelia. 
What? Holy cow. I wonder what, how do you get it out? I, I don't think, <laughs> probably surgically. Dude. They got to just yeah. pull that fucker yeah. out? Yeah, because dude, you know, catfish, like their gills are like razor sharp. You and know, they're trying to pull back. Like, I was just going to say, they're pointing in the wrong direction. Yeah. So you can't pull yeah. it out. Oh, it's like a barb. That. Maybe they have to push it's like it. a barb. Maybe they have yeah. to push it all the way through. Uh, <laughs> I imagine uh, he dies after a while up there, right? He doesn't find what he's looking for. Uh, it's, well, it says parasitic, so I'm, I'm imagining it survives. Eating. You know, yeah. off of what you're doing. Is there, what does that say, Doug? Is it a myth? It's like, it's like me and my little fish. <clears throat> I'm not sure yet. Let me see here. It does say- we're, It we're, says it's a myth. Oh, okay. But mm. let me read deeper on this. Yeah, see? so I feel like it's more likely to happen to a woman, right? Yeah, that, if it goes up horrific. the urethra. Because a guy, it's kind of hard to get- You <laughs> yeah, got to find what's a, happening. Things are moving in there. It's a small little opening. Well, maybe that's the myth of it. I think that's probably what the myth is. I don't think it's really swimming up in your thing. Yeah, and I mean, Mm. how like how much how drunk do you have to be to not know there's a fish? Whoa, something's happening. (laughs) (laughs) You you notice when it's too late. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Anyway, so what so what happened this weekend? Why are we all so sleep deprived? You guys want to tell your stories? Well, I mean, I I I I was. (laughs) Oh really? Oh man. I was. uh, You know, I was moving and packing and stuff like that. That's always stressful and no fun. Although I tell you what. Um, uh, we got a bunch of our public good stuff in the new place. And I don't know if you guys, do you guys use, I, I think one of the best inventions ever was those single wipe Clorexes. It's better than antibiotics. Yeah, yeah. It's better than yeah, nuclear yeah. power. It's up, yes. it's up there. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. not better than those two, but it's up there, right? The, you guys use those? The, yeah, they just pull it out. Pull it up yeah, like it's just brilliant, right? For it. cleaning counters and things like that. So Public Goods has their their version of it and has like this lavender smell. It's amazing. So mm-hmm. we, just got, we just got the whole house stocked up and that was one of the things that Katrina found on the list to replace. And I was using it this whole weekend. I tell you what, man, those things are money. Yeah, I, I get when I get lazy. Like if I make, like if I spill something on the floor, I was like mop the floor with my foot. Yeah. You know, with one of those <laughs> yeah. things. It uh, hey, yeah. works. No, no, it, hell, it works. They haven't been around very long either. I, I don't remember when they first came on the scene, but once we start, once I started using them, I've never looked back. At yeah, that. the thing about public goods is they they stay away from all the weird chemicals. Yeah. Um, and then of course, if you're you know environmentally um, conscious. Uh, that that's a big deal for them. Well, because you see that a lot with cleaning products, it's like insane, like the amount of chemicals like they're using. So I'm always like conscious of that in terms of like whatever's you know I'm using to clean the uh, the dishes with what I'm like cleaning my hands with constantly. You know, shampoos, all that stuff. I'm trying to look for better sources. All yeah, the time. I actually read an article that recommended unless you get the right brand that doesn't have like all the insane chemicals they recommend which i thought was stupid so let's say you buy the brand name you know stuff or whatever and you wipe down your counter with it they recommend you go back over it with a wet cloth which to, to get me, rid of the chemical yeah, residue which is, i'm gonna wash after <laughs> yeah. i wash it you know, know but they, they recommend sounds, to do that oh i didn't know that yeah because redundant. it leaves a residue that is got uh, I, I believe so a lot of these chemicals are xenoestrogens mm-hmm. and it, it you know you get exposed to one it's not gonna make a big deal but you add it up with all the shit that's in pla- yeah, and, just and, inundating yourself with it everywhere. Well, yeah. there's there's a lot of people that believe that, right? That that's oh, bro, what, there's a lot of science that supports it. Now. That we're that, that's why we're there is because there's so much chemicals that we're exposed yeah. to today versus just 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, and this is why this is why it's a good idea for your daily everyday stuff. You know, go to a company like Public Goods. Because they don't use a lot of these chemicals. Um, and, and there's a lot of science now that shows that this may be why you see such a, a drastic dropping of testosterone levels in men over the last few decades. Mm-hmm. It's become an epidemic. And they think it's these chemicals that uh, actually act like estrogens in the damn body. Yeah. Which is crazy. Well, then you add the things like the the creams and the soaps. That's what I mean. Things that you're also putting on your face and your body and stuff like that too. That are all yeah. loaded full of chemicals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, I lost sleep just because I have an infant at home that is just he. I I I think I figured it out though. I think he's a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> he like he sucks the life out of his mom. Yeah. And uh, he's a milk vampire. During the day, he's extremely you know charming and uh, almost like will get you into a trance. And yeah. then at night, he just doesn't sleep. He's wide awake. That so what is right. what is nighttime routine look like for you guys right now? Have you got a set routine, or is it still Dude. kind of figuring that all out? Like, because so you, you're on month four, right? We're almost m- month four. Almost there. Yeah. So so you know he cries or whatever. Jessica right away gives him the boob, and uh, here's the problem with that is that because he doesn't sleep, or he's so broken up, she's getting no sleep whatsoever, and lack of sleep is <laughs> this, it's it's cruel and unusual punishment by the Geneva Convention. It's really yeah. bad, right? Yeah. So finally, you know, I don't want to say finally, I'd say it's, she's just like, look, let's try seeing if 
we can have him try to settle himself down. So we'll stay next to the crib. He'll cry. He can see that we're there, but we got to let him try to figure out how to go to sleep. So she was doing this and he was just, you know, crying because he's used to her, her responding right away. And so last last night or yesterday, it was probably like, I don't know, it was like 7 p.m. This is when he t- starts to go down. I go up there and I'm like, can I let me take over? I'll, I'll take over and I'll sit here. I didn't know she was going to start trying this. But once I saw him, I'm like, let me let me give this a shot. And so she's like, OK. And so she fucking lays it down on the bed behind me and just sits there and texts me <laughs> what to do the whole time. And I'm like, honey. You need if, if you're gonna take a break, you gotta go and yeah, let me uh, do this. And she's like, I can't relax anywhere, so I might as well just sit behind you. I'm like, what's the? I might as well leave. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We both may as well. You're gonna lose your mind, you know. <laughs> let me do this for a second. No, man, uh, it's it was it's hard, man. It's rough, dude. Now, are you do are you putting him in the crib or a bassinet right now? It's bassinet. Okay, so yeah. it's a bassinet. so we have like a bassinet next to the bed. Yeah, he has his own crib in his room. But you're not there yet, right? Nah, just yeah, for naps. Yeah, because I was gonna say we don't. I don't remember. We didn't use the crib till way later. Yeah, on. it's yeah. like six months or yeah. or whatever. Yeah, really but him. oh my gosh, dude, he's just, it's just, it's brutal. It's yeah. so brutal. And so I'm, I, was, I was so mad. I was like, I wanted to tell her, like, I kept telling her, why don't you leave? Like, why are you laying? <laughs> this is like, take a break. Leave. Yeah. And she's like, I can't. I can hear him throughout it's the whole rest. house. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was the deal. Impossible. I mean, Katrina and I made that. That was the deal I made with her when I said, listen, I, I'll I'll do it. Like, so I know you have been going like nonstop, but the deal is like, I'm you have to let me do it my way. Like, you can't, you can't be standing over my shoulder telling me what I need to do because that just defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. The whole purpose mm-hmm. is I'm here to relieve you so you can get some rest because you deserve it and you've been going like crazy but it what's the point if i'm up and i'm handling it's a catch-22 because it's like okay i'm gonna leave but now i'm worried and i hear him crying and i'm still thinking and i get i i I told and so with with jessica i just try and take her lead so i say okay honey you're 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 obviously the full-time mom tell me what you want or how to do this and i'll do this and i'll i'll make i'll say a few things and so at one point you know last night i'm like i don't know maybe he's a little too young mm-hmm. i don't know if this is good, whatever and then that was it i was like wrong thing <laughs> yeah. to say you know <laughs> yeah. because she already felt bad cuz he's crying yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. you know dude when he you know when a baby cries it's this is a, a a real, I mean, this is natural for humans. It's like shell shock for, for oh, moms. Could, could, oh, especially. For, for parents and ge- for people but, in general. Yeah. You just can't stand it. It's normal. That's an evolutionary thing. I hate it. It hurts me to hear it. But for a mom, oh, yeah. oh my God. The first, the first 10 minute yeah. cry that Katrina ever did was that she cried. Oh, oh, she yeah. was bawling. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Jessica was bawling last night. <laughs> oh, yeah. Totally. So, oh. Good times. Yeah. I just had a bunch of crazy, chaotic boy energy to deal with like for the last like five days or so. So, yeah. And, uh, uh, so I I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do every single day and every single minute to to you know express this energy and like do it in a healthy way where we're not just like just killing each What'd other. What you guys do? Yeah, so I I basically just took them down like towards the beach. I took them down towards the mall, which apparently was like just quarters of it were open, and then we were just walking everywhere. And then I'm taking the dogs with me too because I got two you know male dogs, and you know they're just like crazy and like chomping at the bit to like run. And so I'm trying to find like every park on the planet. In, in Santa Cruz to, to go find, to go like get all this energy out and do all this stuff. And I ended up just like, like posting up outside, uh, you know, grilling on the Traeger. And then I was like, cause it takes so long. I was just like, I threw meat on there. I'm like grilling it. And then I'm like practicing bow and arrow and stuff just to, to find Zen. You know, <laughs> like I was trying to find like ways of finding Zen in the chaos. And so, dude, I highly recommend like shooting bow and arrows, dude. It gets you like really like, you know, like present and, uh, you know, like it focused and everything. And then so I was doing that. And then I'm like, what else? Uh, smoke a cigar. Like, dude, that totally. Oh, I saw your down. post. Oh, yeah. dude. Oh, dude, I was getting roasted. Yeah. I loved it. Your dude. son's face and behind you. Is hilarious. Oh, and the, and that oh was, yeah. Did you get judged? I caught him like that, too. And I wasn't like staged. Like I was just like I was laughing because like you know i just felt this like you know you know you feel an energy of like somebody just behind you like <laughs> like i felt that and like it's so funny they get so mad at me when i when i smoke a cigar for some reason same with mike yeah i had uh i don't know what, you we, brought it up you brought it up on the podcast like i don't know like six seven months ago you had a cigar and you said that your daughter came out was yeah like, well because there's that place over here around the corner that sells tobacco pipes cigars whatever and uh, i'm not a i'm not a cigar smoker but every once in a while, I'll buy a couple and I'll I'll do it for a week and then I won't for six months or a year. Literally, that little, right? But there was one point, I don't remember what it was, I bought like four or five, which is a lot. And I don't smoke a whole cigar at one sitting. It's because I don't yeah, smoke I cigars. Yeah, do half. Yeah, I'll do like half or a quarter. Otherwise, I'm going to get nauseous or whatever. So there was like a two-week period where at night, I'd go out to the back 
I'd sit in my lounge chair or whatever, and I'd have a cigar. And my daughter would be inside just just <laughs> judging me, telling Jessica, she's like, I don't know how I feel about uh, papa, you know, smoking. I don't yeah, know, if I, I, don't know yeah, if I like this yeah. or whatever. I, like, I'd come inside and she'd be yeah. distant, you know? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Dad, I thought you talked about, like, health and fitness. Yeah. What is this? <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> like, oh, shit. I like, know. Sometimes daddy needs to relax. I, okay? That's you got to stress me out. That's when all the vices come out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Hey, so um, I was reading an article article on uh just trends in america like market trends or whatever did you guys know that men grooming men's grooming products in america is i believe a six billion dollar if i'm not mistaken industry and Dude. it wasn't that way yeah i was gonna day. say this has to be a new thing it's 60 billion globally in america it's 6.9 billion it's a big business. Well, wow. you know, that was one of the things that I was concerned. When we first started to work with Caldera, like I fell in love with the product instantly, but my biggest concern was like, God, is there, is there, am I, is there demand? Yeah. yeah is there for, enough, is there enough guys that are care? willing to spend this kind yeah. of money on a product for their face and stuff like that? And I was really, I was really suspicious of it. I didn't think that we were going to. And I remember hearing back from them after our first couple commercials and I was like ready to for like the ledge. Cause every once in a while that happens, right? We get with a company, we try something out that maybe one of us likes and it goes, okay, it's a little flat with the whole audience, I was anticipating this, you know, call where they're like, yeah, you know, thanks for the advertising, but you know, at those rates, we can't really convert, blah, 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 blah. blah. And that was the complete opposite. Well, the thing mm. about Caldera is, because I, I could see like men's grooming products that to make you look good, to that kind of stuff. But Caldera focuses on uh, like health, the health yeah. of your skin, right? right. So they're, so they're, for example, there's their face serum. If you have really dry skin, it balances out. If you have oily skin, see, I have oily skin, so I was the least, I was the most reluctant. I never put anything on my face because it's always so oily. Yeah. Because I'm like, if I put some on, I'm gonna be like, <laughs> I'm gonna look like like an olive. You know what I mean? Like olive oil coming <laughs> yeah. out of my face. But it actually balanced out uh, my skin. And it, you know, of course, when you look at the the ingredients, it's about skin health. It's not just about look better. Right, right now, right. so but that's a big industry, dude. Huge, uh, yeah. six billion dollars, yeah. and and growing. It's growing very, very rapidly. So it's like, uh, yeah, I wonder how long until the big, big manufacturers really start to step in, and you know, get into that market. Are they not already? Are they not into that? I mean, you I, know, I think it's like you know they'll do it with like deodorant, hairspray, yeah, the main, the beard main. grooming is is huge right thing now. Right yeah. now, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you remember that was one of the first things that we tried was a uh, beard oil way back when we mm -hmm. did that. We uh -huh. did that really early on the podcast to see how that took off. Yeah, yeah. That's there's definitely I think I mean and plus that's kind of the whole hipster thing right now. So it's every, definitely the hipster yeah. uh, element. Yeah, because yeah, I mean if you see any barbershop now, everybody has these like crazy angular lines to their beard and like you know they, they put way too much effort into like styling their hair and, and you know having like the most perfect you know like a, a, like ironed shirt and I'm like dude fuck calm <laughs> dude, down that's so weird dude <laughs> Jesus yeah that's a little yeah. too far yeah. my, like my brother like gets his eyebrows waxed and I'm like <laughs> like perfect. Bah -bah. Ah, you yeah, know, across yeah, his face, yeah. and I'm, I, I'm like, when he does it, I'm like, come on, dude. Like, you look like a cartoon. You know? Stop I mean, if you I had, have a couple imperfections, hey, if cool. I had some fucked up eyebrows, I would totally do it. You know what I'm saying? Well, but you, you guys, you, in your family, you guys don't have like crazy eyebrows, uh, do you? I mean, I get it. If you if you got one, you know, if you're like a unibrow, yeah, like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You know, like, dude, I hate crazy. the ones that get away from you, though. You know, you wake up and they're just. Well, yeah, you have like the old man. I got like, the owl ones that just like go everywhere. No, I got that too, bro. What is it about turning 40 where yeah. your eyebrow hair, your and, eyebrows, and white. all of a sudden, they don't stop growing? Yeah. I, I, I get that. You know how I know, by the way? I'll like looking around, I'm like, what's in my eye? Yeah, there's like, it's a freaking eyebrow hair. It, like <laughs> obstructing my, my view. Yeah. yeah. Or, or ear hair. Yeah. Where does that come from uh, all of a sudden? Little dangles. I, yeah. It's weird. It's a, it's a cruel thing. You yeah. know, it's like, oh, hair on your head? Nah. Yeah. Let's give you some hair in places Ears, you didn't, nose you didn't want yeah. it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the nether regions. Yeah. What the hell is that all about? Oh, yeah. Anyway, dude, uh, you know how I brought up in the past um, the research by Dr. John Gottman? Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So just a little recap for, for people who didn't listen to that. That was a long time ago the relationship doc yes he did research on uh couples relationship research and it's so here's the thing with with this with these types of sciences his, uh, his famous book is love and logic is uh no uh what is his what's his favorite oh gosh he's got a famous book but he's known for yes maybe doug can find it, it. wasn't love and logic no that's um that's I someone else. a series he did that's also very good yeah. by the way yeah i thought that was him yeah i thought that was him too. yeah so maybe maybe it is but um he talks about like the four horsemen of like you know predicting if a relationship's gonna end oh, right. yeah that kind of, so here's the thing with like studies on psychology, relationships, social sciences. 
the studies that come out are very rarely able to be replicated. So they say that it's like, you know, take a study with a grain of salt if it has to do with people's psychology because they'll try to replicate it. And I think it's something like 70% they can't replicate. So it's basically like throw it out the window. Right. Well, his studies have been replicated dozens of times with extreme consistency. So you can basically take what he says as truth. And so what he would do in these studies is he'd have these, these houses Couples would go in, they'd hook up heart rate monitors, cameras, and then they would tell the couples, uh, you know, talk about a difficult subject and they'd observe them or they'd just observe them in general and see what's going on. And they do this for years. And they ended up piecing together a few things to the point where the accuracy was so cl- was so good where they could predict, I think it was something like 80% accuracy, uh, whether or not you'd be divorced just by watching you you and your spouse or your your whoever your your significant significant other conversing or arguing for five minutes they could predict with like incredible accuracy whether or not you're gonna make mm-hmm. it for the next mm-hmm. five years what does that book say the seven principles of making marriages work that's the bit that's that's the big one okay so anyway I printed out these these forms because it was really easy to kind of see what the four horsemen were and what the antidotes were. So I want to kind of tell you. Give me a guess. They're they're really, really good. You want to take a guess on some of them? Yeah, one of them's contempt. You're right. Contempt is one of them. So contempt, there's criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. These are the Mm. four horsemen of relationships. The antidotes to them, so the antidote to criticism was a gentle startup. The antidote to contempt was appreciation. The antidote to defensiveness was responsibility. And then stonewalling was self-soothing meaning meaning the way to keep from those things happening in a relationship yeah so to give you an example criticism is verbally attacking your partner's personality or character so it's not a complaint it's not like you said you know like your wife says hey you forgot you didn't take out the trash it's basically saying yeah, i can't stand this about you yeah like yeah. you you never you remember always do this yes yeah. that would that be criticism the the antidote to that is a gentle startup so you want to tell your spouse there's something they did wrong you want to talk about your feelings, use I statements, and express a positive need. So if you have a good startup to that conversation, the success is much higher versus coming at someone angry, you're just not going to succeed yeah. when you do that. Uh, the stonewalling, this is when someone withdraws to avoid conflict, conveys disapproval, distance, and separation. So it's like you're, you're arguing, and then all of a sudden your significant other just, whatever, stops listening to you, ignores you, or creates distance. That's a bad thing. The antidote to that is self-soothing. So take a break to spend time doing something soothing and distracting. So when you find yourself get to that point, you take a break and go do something for yourself. Uh, I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to go on a drive. The person that's getting stonewalled or the person that's stonewalled? The, the person that feels like they're stonewalling, yeah. let, me take, let me take a break. Gotcha. I'm going to take a break and I'm going to go do something for me so I can come back. I did, uh, I've found this with working out. I know when I exercise, I come back totally different yeah. than when I don't. It's probably the only one I'm good at, by the way, out of all of these. Uh, <laughs> then, there, then the defensiveness. This is where you victimize themselves to deflect a perceived attack and reverse the blame on the partner. Mm-hmm. The antidote is to accept their partner's perspective. That's probably one of the hardest ones, uh, mm-hmm. I, would, I would imagine. I know mm-hmm. it is for me. So when you know, Jessica says something to me, I don't, it's hard for me. I, I want to immediately defend myself, mm-hmm. right? And then the last one was contempt and appreciation, attacking your partner's sense of self with an intent to insult or abuse. So you just just basically just being mean for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. And the antidote is to remind themselves of their partner's positive qualities and find gratitude, gratitude and positive actions. This one's actually super powerful. So like you're upset with your partner. This one takes a lot of self awareness. You find yourself super angry with them. Pause and say, "All right, what do I appreciate about the person?" It just takes a tremendous amount of self awareness. I think all of these do, right? I think yeah. that, that that's the key to this. Is like it's great to have like tools like this, but if you don't have the self awareness to realize that you're in the middle of yeah. one of those situations, can you pause? Yeah, I mean that's a big thing, and I think too in that study, you're, like it was about heart rate, right? Mm, and, yeah, and like how that you know really was the determiner whether or not they were going to get like in this like insano fight uh, versus like just take a second like okay and then we'll we'll talk about your points you know after they noticed that their heart rate had gone down dude it, they, so what they would to be more specific they, they would see couples would start to get heated and they'd see their heart rates go up and they didn't tell the couple to take a break You're right they would go in the room and they'd tell the couple something like hey our cameras went down would you mind pausing what you guys are talking about so that we can get them to come back up and then yeah. we'll tell you when it's when, when everything they'd works. they wait for the heart rates to come down. They'd wait as long as it took for the heart rates to come down. As soon as the heart rates came down, they'd come in and be like, okay, everything's working. You can reconvene and talk about what you were talking about. The success rate went through the roof just from that alone. And it's obvious when your emotions are high, 
logic. It's like, an, it's like this is the relationship. Emotions go up, logic goes down. So yeah. you have to know that when your emotions are high, you're not going to be logical at all. Yeah. You, you know what I was like? I was sort of pondering this over the weekend, and uh, this doesn't have to do with relationships, but it does in a sense to where you know we've been interviewing people about like cancel culture and you know what's happening in the world, this kind of stuff, um, and you just don't see any uh, you know news or any kind of movement towards like redemption, any 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 types mm-hmm. of forgiveness movements out there uh, that are really you know assessing. Uh, you know, some the intent and, and people's character and also giving them a chance to, you know, redeem themselves, to come back strong and to, you know, move past their mistakes. Like, I just don't see that anywhere. And it's really frustrating. You know, you're 100% right. I agree with you. I think it's because forgiveness is, be, is viewed as weak. It's viewed as weak. Mm. So like to give an example, let's say you have a couple and one of the one of them and they're, let's say they're married with kids or whatever. One of them has an affair. And then they, you know, go to counseling. It takes a couple of years, but they end up staying together, whatever. A lot of people may view the person who who was cheated on as being weak. Oh, you're weak. How dare you take that person back or whatever. I think in social media, it's more celebrated to show your rage. Yeah. Oh, I hate this person. Ah, yeah. That, that's all I see. Instead of saying, look, the person was, you know, 20 when they said that or did that or it was a different time. They're different now. Oh, shut up! You're you're obviously you think it's okay that they said that type of deal. Mm-hmm. It's not valued, and so we make it. You know, so instead, what do we show? How angry we are, and how much we're not going to forget. Well, I also think that we're being conditioned right now to think that everything is a, a, an attack. Even like I'm reading uh, the coddling of the American mind, right? I'm going through that, and they're just talking about that. We've that's what's happened in the right de- last decade is. Now, when people make these these mistakes verbally, right, they say something that they don't realize is offensive to somebody else. It's a simple mistake that an apology can come afterwards, or I'm sorry, oh, I didn't think that offended you. Yeah. But we've gotten to a place where every single thing that is said or done is taken like it's a personal attack mm-hmm. on somebody, right. and we're getting conditioned to think that. So, and like to your point all the time, Sal, is that there's you know there's like a virtue in in being a victim. You know, mm-hmm. like everyone's wanting to be a victim. Like so. I think that's part of it is it getting conditioned to thinking that way too. Yeah, I would mm-hmm. I would I would 100% uh, agree with that. I think um it's it is very interesting. It, you know, kind of what's what's happening with the fact that we're so connected and that anybody has a platform and that the crazier your response is the more, you know, views it's going to get or whatever. And then that gives it value. It seems like it has authority. Yeah. And so people just, you know, go down that path and I think that's uh it's very self-destructive. I, I think mm-hmm. that it, all of it started with good intentions like so i was the, the the book actually went over like where a lot of these things like microaggressions and you know being sensitive to people's th- feelings a, a lot of these papers that were written by oxford uh, professors brown university professors harvard professors brilliant pieces of, of of paper that had the right intentions it's what we we've done with it though and yeah. taken it to weaponized us. it almost. yes yes 100 yeah. yes. it's been weaponized yep first question is from desert gecko 87 My fiance noticed that one half of my body is not as developed as the other. I have started doing priming and starter exercises along with the starting strength big five lifts. What advice would you suggest to correct this imbalance? Are we assuming that this is top to bottom and not left to right, or is this left to right and not top to bottom? Because oh, that's interesting. I think it was left to right, actually. Okay, yeah. yeah. Left yeah, to this or is different, right. It's different for either one. Well, yeah, I was well, going to say, yeah. it's important to make that clear, because if, you're, if I'm talking to someone who is left to right, I'm going to give the advice of doing unilateral work, so single arm, single leg, starting with the weaker side always first, mirroring that on the opposite side. Mm-hmm. But if it's top to bottom, I would say reduce the volume on the overdeveloped Part portion of your body, whether it be lower or upper, and then increase yeah, the increase volume. The frequency. I, I'll say this: so starting strength is probably one of the most sound online uh, workout programs you'll have. You'll see anywhere. Very basic, very simple, but it's uh, effective, um, and it's it's a great workout program. Um, I have really no not too much negative to say with it, aside from at some point no, you want to phase out of it. And very move similar stuff. to mm-hmm. MAPS Anabolic. Yes, there's a lot of similarities, right, with yeah. MAPS Anabolic. Here's the problem with it, though. If you do have a left-to-right imbalance, um, the starting strength is barbell-focused. Mm-hmm. It's it, What's going to happen is you're probably going to maintain this imbalance between right and left, especially if it's if it's really apparent. Like, And I see this in uh, athletes. I've trained uh, rowers. Where you know they're on one side of the boat, and th- there's definitely an imbalance between these. I've, I've I've trained pitchers, 
uh, I've trained, you know, and this usually you see this with some types of athletes where there's a very big difference between right and left. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, Adam's 100%. I'm 100% I'm on board. Use dumbbells, unilateral, start yep. with the weak side. Let the weak side dictate how much weight and reps you do. It might feel easy for the stronger side for a while, mm -hmm. but this is really the only way to start to balance it out. And it'll start to balance itself out. It takes a little time, but it'll start to balance itself out. If you stick to barbells, you're going to maintain this imbalance for a long time. Next question is from Josh Buckholtz. Should you eat the same amount of calories on a rest day as a workout day? This question we get this question a lot, actually. Yeah. And you know, the, the the theory or the idea here is like, oh, okay, when I'm training, right, you're lifting really hard and you're exercising, and so the body needs more calories uh, because you're exercising. And on a, on a calorie burn day, right, you would probably burn more calories on a workout day than a rest day. But when you're strength training and you're lifting weights, the recovery process is just as important. So the additional calories that you would eat over what potentially you burn for the day hopefully gets partitioned over to building muscle. Right. So it really isn't about a day-to-day -day thing. It's more like, and it's not even a week thing, but it's easier to look at a week and say, these are my calories allotted for the week. And it doesn't really matter if it's rest or low day. You can undulate them. You can keep them the same. Right. It, it doesn't Would really you manipulate like your your macro balance for that on on recovery days, for instance, like say upping, you know, your protein and, and fat intake versus you, you know, and then like adding a bit more carbohydrates on days you're more active. So I would I would only for behavior reasons. Mm -hmm. Not yep. for not for calorie need, protein need, and macro need. Yep. I would do it based off of behaviors, right? So and that's a really good question. I do manipulate that. Not both though, because I'm going, oh, I didn't exercise today, so I'm going to go lower carb. It's more like I know when I go lower carb, it suppresses my appetite in comparison to when I'm high carb. So I don't want to be, I don't want to overconsume while I'm also being kind of lazy and sitting around for the day. Mm -hmm. So I might, I might adjust my macros based off of what I know my behaviors are. But when you're talking about the science of what the calories are going to do for your body, whether it's going to put on fat or put on muscle, it doesn't matter that yeah, much. Yeah, this is a, one of those splitting hairs, yes. uh, it doesn't matter uh, conversations. It really doesn't matter. You know you know who this matters for? The high-performing extreme athlete where you want to have an increase of 1% performance on game day, in which case I'd say make sure you have a carbohydrate-rich yeah, meal. Do kind of a carb cycle. Yeah, two hours before type of deal. For everybody else, this is, it doesn't matter. You know how you base your decision on this? Exactly what Adam said, your behaviors. Uh, do you feel like you want to eat less on the days you don't work out? Or do you feel like you want to eat more? Do you find that you overeat? Do you find that some people on the days they don't work out, they find they're less disciplined with their nutrition? In which case you might want to avoid trigger foods. Like Adam said for him was carbohydrates. It's the same for me. Um, so I may want to do something like that. I think you should base, you're, you're going to be far better off basing this decision off your behaviors than you are on mm -hmm performance or yeah, muscle gains. gain or fat loss because it really uh, doesn't make a, a difference at all. For me personally, I tend to, to do better eating less carbs on the days I don't work out, but it's not because I'm not having the carbs to burn for energy or whatever. It's really, it's exactly like what you said, Adam. I, I'll, I'll overeat otherwise. Carbs are trigger foods for me. If I have rice or potatoes or whatever, I'm more likely to keep pushing my calories. And so I, and, and because I'm not working out, I got more time on my hands. It tends to be on the weekend when I'm with the mm -hmm. family. So I'll just avoid those things to try, unless I'm bulking, in which case, uh, then I'll throw them well, in. And, and this a is a classic example of also how I use like, you know, extended periods between a meal, meal timing or, you know, quote unquote, intermittent fasting is I'll go, oh, hey, this is a day I'm not going to train. So normally I would get up and have breakfast by 7 or 8 a.m. Right. I'm not going to eat until noon because I know I'm not going to be training also today. If I start right out the gates eating some carb-rich carb meal, then I'm going to want to eat two hours or three hours later again. And so it's more behavior than it is, oh, I can't eat that yeah. I'm going to get o fat. Overall, here, this is a, I'm gonna, I'll stand by the statement all day long. Overall, for most people, if you were to base your eating, your nutrition, based off your behaviors and how you felt, you'd be far better off than if you based it off of what you read in a study that's the ideal amount of calories, macronutrients, and maximized performance type stuff. Way better off. Yeah. The behavior it's much based- much more likely to stick. More likely too. to stick. You're going to get better results long term. You're going to be more consistent. 
it's going to make you feel better, improve your health better than being so regimented about, oh, today's a workout day. Got to increase my carbs. Got to drop this. Got to do that. And again, I can see some benefit when you're at extreme level. You're going to go on stage. You're 3% body fat. You know, an ounce of water under your skin makes a difference. So now you got to make sure everything's perfect or whatever. Or you're a super high level athlete and the difference between you and second place, you know, first and second place is a, you know, a millisecond, in which case you're going to want to time things and make it's going to make a difference. But for everybody else, it makes no difference. In, in, again, the behaviors are what you should focus on when it comes to nutrition. Next question is from Taylor Baca. When should I start to prioritize organic grass-fed and non-GMO type foods? All right. Here's the list of priorities, okay? Calories, number one. Number two, macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs. Number three, now you can start to get into this kind of stuff. If your calories are high, your macros are off, you can eat all the grass-fed, organic, non-GMO foods that you want, and you're going to, you know, potentially, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if your calories are. Now, that being said, healthy, and I'm going to go quote here, healthy foods, and I don't mean healthy processed foods, I mean actual unprocessed whole foods, tend to help you eat better, you know, or more appropriate levels of calories uh, and macronutrients. High, heavily processed foods, even heavily processed health foods, tend to make you overeat. So in this case, then you can start to prioritize those foods, knowing that it's going to help you tackle the most important things first, which are calories and macros. This is interesting. I, I agree with that. But also what I've noticed personally uh, when I've gone more grass fed and grass finished and all that is, you know, how my body receives it in terms of like, like if you have any kind of food intolerance, allergy, anything that's inflammatory, like, uh, you know, that's going to affect my digestive process. And a lot of times I feel like people just don't uh, aren't aware of, uh, you know, pinpointing exactly where that's coming from. And they're just sort of yeah. dealing it and medicating it constantly. Um, and if they paid a lot more attention to the actual food that they're consuming, I think that that would, uh, you know, push them a little bit more into choosing more quality foods. Uh, my answer to this is always. I mean, I, I'm always prioritizing it. Sometimes it doesn't happen though. Yeah. And I don't freak out about it. Mm. I mean, if I have the option that I can get grass fed, non GMO, and not processed foods, that's 99% of the time, that's what I want to eat. But the reality is there's times, I mean, this was a classic example. I'm in the middle of a move and moving furniture and doing shit. We have, we had, we packed our, gro <laughs> packed our entire refrigerator up. So I'm eating out for a couple of days. Like I'm not going to freak out, you know, I'm not going to make it, oh, I'm not going to lose all my gains or, oh my God, I'm going to poison my body. and it'll be so fucked. It's like, yeah. okay, it's not ideal. But then when I have the option and I can get back to, and could I have made the priority, could I have still made a choices that were non-GMO, non-processed foods? Of course I could have, mm -hmm. but it's like, Jesus, I'm not going to add a bunch more stress to a stressful weekend of moving and stuff like that. Not worrying about it. But then when I'm grocery shopping and I'm like picking things out, I'm very mindful of these things. Yeah. You, you actually said something that's very important. You said unprocessed. Now he didn't say this. The person didn't say this in the question because you could have, you know, could you get non-GMO chips, you know, non-GMO organic, you know, cookies yeah, or candy. gummy bears yeah. <laughs> or, you know, something, you know, uh, a, you know, a ice cream cone or whatever. Natural. You could. Does that mean it's going to be good? No, it's, it's probably going to cause you to overeat. Uh, the most important thing uh, from a, uh, just from a behavior standpoint is avoiding heavily processed foods, healthy or not, organic or not. Heavily processed foods encourage overeating. From a behavioral standpoint, simply avoiding Heavily processed foods tends to get people to eat more appropriate levels of calories. This was a trick. This was a hack that I figured out late into my career. Remember, originally my career was like, hit your targets, hit your calories, here's your meal plan, whatever. It, wildly unsuccessful. I'd have some success with the most disciplined clients, but they'd also fall off at some point. At some point, I started saying this to people. You know what? Don't worry about anything else. Yep. Just eat whole foods. Just eat whole natural foods. And what would happen is they'd lose weight and get in better health because- it encourages more appropriate levels of eating. This is very obvious if you've done this a few times. If you've done, if you've gone on a, a whole foods diet where you've been consistently eating nothing but whole foods for like thirty days, and then you introduce something that's highly processed, even if it's considered healthy, like let's say like a protein bar, which mm -hmm. I this happened to me with competing. I got, I messed around with this a few times, and it was it blew my mind that uh, first of all, when I ate that heavily processed food, it actually didn't taste as good as it used to taste because I was so used to whole foods. 
And then I got, I had a second one and then a third one. Okay, now all of a sudden, not only did I get used to that taste, I like that taste. Now I was craving that. And then I went from like one bar to two bars to three bars a day, and it kicked that that craving back up. So if you've done that enough times where you've completely eliminated all these processed foods, eat whole foods for a while, then introduce it and just pay attention to your own behaviors. Totally. And yeah. see what happens. Yeah, I mean, the if you look at all the food categories, here's how you know, right? Look at all the food category, categories. Chips, uh, you know, frozen foods, um, you know, cookies, health foods. The number one, the, the top five sellers of every category, including health foods, are because they taste the best. It's not because, look at the health food category. Look at the top five selling protein powders, top five selling green juices, top five selling whatever. The reason why they're the top five is not because they're the best with their ingredients, it's because they taste the best. In fact, you listening or watching this podcast probably picked your health food, whatever, because of the taste. This is what happens. So heavily processed foods, they're so palatable. They're designed to be that way. So a lot of the money goes into uh, you know designing these foods this way. They make you overeat. Avoid those, and then things start to kind of balance out kind of naturally. I know it sounds crazy, but it's totally true. Next question is from Aaron Kirsch7. How do you explain the importance of rest periods to the hit-driven client? I used to, this was a constant conversation oh, yeah. with people, yeah. right? Um, and, you know, I would get into the whole you know, energy systems of the body. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're constantly exercising, not taking breaks, <laughs> you try to explain the Krebs cycle. Yeah. It's, like, it's yeah. glycolytic and yeah. you know, and you're just building endurance. You're not building the adaptation that we want, which is strength and muscle to speed up the metabolism. That's why taking rest is so important, which is, which is all uh, very, very true. Um, here's the deal. Uh, what is your goal with your workouts? Mm -hmm. Is your goal to burn as many calories as possible during the time you're working out? Or is the goal to cause a favorable adaptation for your body? Okay, two separate things. If you just want to burn calories, then don't take any rest periods. Keep moving yeah. and make it intense. Just move constantly. Yeah, that'll burn the most calories. In which case, I'd say there's no reason to do hit with anything with, with weights, dumbbells, machines. Just sprint on a treadmill and you'll burn the most amount of calories. If your goal is to cause favorable adaptations, you want to speed up the, the metabolism, build muscle, balance out hormones, you want to shape and sculpt your body. In that case, take your rest periods and build muscle. That's it. That's the bottom line. So what's your goal? You want to burn a lot of calories in an hour? And by the way, I used to tell my clients this. Oh, you want to burn a lot of calories in an hour? There's no need to hire me. You actually don't need my expertise. I'll tell you what to do. You see that treadmill over yeah. there? Go run real hard You're for jumping an hour. jacks in the sauna. And you, you don't need to work with me at all. Well, yeah. I you know, I had to battle this a lot too. And one of the things that I I would first have learned like like uh if you as a, cha a trainer, if you challenge your client all the time, especially if they're smart or they like what they're doing, they always resist push back or put a wall up. So a lot of times I would I would commend them for what the way they're training and say, "Listen, there's a lot of value in how you like to train right now. The problem is you lose a lot of that value after about 4 to 6 weeks." our body gets very adapted to whatever modality or whatever we're doing, like the way you're training. And then the results that you like from it, the burning the body fat, the building muscle, all that part that you enjoyed, those returns start to really diminish. My job as a personal trainer is to be constantly programming and switching you up so that your body is consistently seeing those results that you love so much. And if we stay in this way of mm -hmm. training, you're going to see very minimal results beyond that six-week period of time. If you want to keep the results coming, we need to completely change out of this. And completely changing out of it means we need longer rest periods. We need these mm -hmm. straight sets. We need to train differently for a while. That doesn't mean we won't come back to this way of training that you love to do because there will be value here again yeah you have to highlight that it's different for a reason and and you know a lot of times uh, i'll get the clients like this and they're in a plateau they're already in a, a space where they've been doing this long term they just want you to ramp the intensity up further and that's why they hired you mm -hmm. and so to to be able to you know connect with them and, and show them that well you know i know this is something that had worked initially for you but you're, you're seeing a wall you know just to throttle down more you know it's only going to get us so far why don't you trust me and, and we're going to try something completely different uh it's going to be, you know, hard, you know, mentally to get through this. That's what I'm here for. Uh, but honestly, you know, we need to build up your strength. We need to focus on building muscle and that takes rest. And so we have to include this in our workouts. Yeah. It's those clients that want, they don't realize this is what they want, but they just want a boot camp instructor just to yell at them, to keep them uh, motivated. You know, I used to, I would see trainers like this. They were good at that. Mm -hmm. And I could, I would predict, oh, get three, four months, that client's not going to come back or they're going to burn out or they're going to get injured. They're going to plateau real hard. And they'd have these huge turnover of clients. 
They'd be real good at that. Ah, yeah, you push hard. Come on, you can do it. In fact, you'd see them in the gym. That's basically what they would do. They'd just torch them. And yeah, and see you later. And you'd see this huge turnover of clients, you know, except for the one or two occasional, like, you know, gluttons for punishment. They just have this huge turnover. The trainers that were successful were the ones that understood that their value was not in the, you know, pushing you to maximum intensity all the time. That does not last. I mean, look, here's the deal. Burning calories manually is hard fucking work. I mean, I if I told you to dig a, a 10-foot hole, could you do it with a teaspoon? You could, but why wouldn't you use a backhoe? You, you have a backhoe accessible. Just use that. You're going to dig that hole in you know, 10 minutes instead of being out here for the next two weeks trying to dig uh, you know, this, this big hole. Like, Can you burn calories manually to cause weight loss? You could. Boy, it's a lot of work, though. You're going to be doing hours and hours and hours a day for the rest of your life in order to do that. Why don't we teach your body? Why don't we just teach your body to do that for you? So that you can, you know, sit down, enjoy a movie with your kids, hang out, and your metabolism is a hot furnace, mm. burning calories. That's what rest periods, building strength and become muscle, does. Become the backhoe. <laughs> Absolutely, become yeah. the backhoe. There's lots of meaning there. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come find us on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on social media. By the way, I'm not shadow banned anymore. I've been released. Free at last. Hooray! Uh, so you, can, you can find us all on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Adaptogenic herbs are compounds that help the body deal with stress. Okay, think about it this way. Imagine if you have a, a bucket. And it's a one-gallon bucket, and that's your stress bucket. So every stress that you have, you know, bad sleep, argument with the wife, I'm in traffic, you know, whatever. All the stress fills up that bucket.